Chapter 5, The Coming of the Lord. How the Negro became free because the North could not win the Civil War if he remained in slavery, and how arms in his hands and the prospect of arms in a million more black hands brought peace and emancipation to America. Three movements, partly simultaneous and partly successive, are treated in different chapters. In the last chapter, we chronicalize the swarming of the slaves to meet the approaching Union armies. In this, we considered how these slaves were transformed in part from laborers to soldiers fighting for their own freedom. And in succeeding chapters, we shall treat the organization of free labor after the war. In the ears of the world, Abraham Lincoln on the 1st of January, 1863, declared four million slaves, thenceforth and forever free. The truth was less than this. The Emancipation Proclamation applied only to the slaves of those states or parts of states still in rebellion against the United States government. Hundreds of thousands of such slaves are already free by their own action and that of the invading armies, and in their cases, Lincoln's proclamation only added possible legal sanction to an accomplished fact. To the majority of slaves still within the Confederate lines, the proclamation would apply only if they followed the fugitives. And this Abraham Lincoln determined to induce them to do, and thus to break the back of the rebellion by depriving the South of its principal labor force. Emancipation had thus two ulterior objects. It was designed to make easier the replacement of unwilling Northern white soldiers with black soldiers. And it sought to put behind the war a new push towards Northern victory by the mighty impact of a great moral ideal, both in the North and in Europe. This national right about face had been gradually and carefully accomplished only by the consummate tact of a leader of men who went no faster than his nation marched, but just as fast. And also by the unwearying will of the abolitionists who forced the nation onward. Wendham Phillips said in Washington in 1862, gentlemen of Washington, you have spent for us $2 million per day. You bury two regiments a month, 2000 men by disease without battle. You rob every laboring man of one half of his pay by the next 30 years by your taxes. You place the curse of intolerable taxation on every cradle for the next generation. What do you have us, what do you have to give us in return? What is the other side of the balance sheet? The North has poured out its blood and money like water. It has leveled every fence of constitutional privilege, and Abraham Lincoln sits today with more unlimited despot than the world knows this side of China. What does he render the North for his unbounded confidence? Show us something, or I tell you that within two years, the indignant reaction of the people will hurl the cabinet in contempt from their seats, and the devils that went out from yonder capital for there has been no sweeping or garnishing, will come back seven times stronger. For I do not believe that Jefferson Davis, driven down to the Gulf, will go down to the waters and perish as certain brutes mentioned in the gospel did. Horace Greeley was at Lincoln's heels. He wrote in August 1862 his editorial, Prayer of 20 Millions, which drew Lincoln's well-known reply, if there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time save slavery, I do not agree with them. If there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time destroy slavery, I do not agree with them. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it would help save the Union. Suppose I do that, said Lincoln to Greeley, discussing general emancipation. There are now 20,000 of our muskets on the shoulders of Kentuckians who are bravely fighting our battles. Every one of them will be thrown down and carried over to the rebels. Let them do it, said Greeley. The cause of the Union will be stronger if Kentucky should secede with the rest than it is now. In September 1862, Lincoln said to representatives of the Chicago Protestants, I admit that slavery is at the root of the rebellion, or at least it's sine qua non. 
I will only concede that emancipation would help us in Europe. I grant further that it would help somewhat at the North, though not so much, I fear, as you and those you represent imagine, and that unquestionably it would weaken the rebels by drawing off their laborers, which is of great importance, but I'm not so sure we could do much with the blacks. If we were to arm them, I fear that in a, in a few weeks, the arms would be in the hands of the rebels. What good would a proclamation of, an, of emancipation for me do, especially as we are now situated? I do not want to issue a document that the whole world will see must necessarily be an operative, like the Pope, like the Pope's bull against the comet. Nevertheless, just nine days later, Lincoln issues his preliminary emancipation proclamation. What caused a sudden change? Was it the mounting mass of Negroes rushing into Union lines? Was it the fighting of Negro soldiers, which showed that weapons given to them were never found in the hands of Confederates? Or was it the curious international situation? The failure or success of the war hung by a thread. If England and France should recognize the Confederacy, there was little doubt that the Union cause would be beaten and they were disposed to recognize it or did lincoln realize that since a draft law was needed to make unwilling northern soldiers fight black soldiers were the last refuge of the union the preliminary proclamation came in september and in october and november mass meetings in new york and brooklyn denounced the proposal as inexpedient and adopted and adopted resolutions against it with jeers Ministers, like the Reverend Albert Barnes of Philadelphia, preached against emancipation, declaring that the control of slavery ought to be left absolutely and exclusively to the states. The New York Herald pointed out that even if the proclamation was effective, slave property would have to be restored or paid for eventually by the United States government. The Herald is correct. The slaves taken from our citizens during the war have to be accounted for at, at its end, either by restoration or indemnity. The New Orleans Picayune pointed out in November that abolition would flood the North with Negroes and that this would tend to degrade white labor and to cheapen it. The final proclamation was issued January 1st, 1863 and carried a special admonition to the colored people. And I hereby enjoin upon the people so declared to be free to abstain from all violence, unless it necessary self-defense. And I recommend to them that in all cases, when allowed, they labor faithfully for reasonable wages. And I further declare and make known that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and to man vessels of all sorts in said service. And upon this act, sincerely believed to be an act of justice warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity. I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God. The Charleston Courier jeered, the Pope's bull against the comet has been issued. And I suppose Mr. Lincoln now breathes more freely. The wonderful man by a dash of his wonderful pen has set free on paper all the slaves of the South and henceforth this is to be in all its length and breadth, the land of liberty. Meanwhile, I would invite his own and the attention of all his deluded followers to a paragraph in the late number of the New Orleans Picayune, wherein it is stated that inquests had been held upon the bodies of 21 contrabands in one house alone in that city. These poor Negroes had been stolen or enticed away from the comfortable homes of their masters and left to starve and rot by the philanthropic advocates of liberty for the slave. The Savannah Republican in March declared, in our judgment so far as the border states are concerned, his proposition will have exactly the opposite effect to that for which it was designed. Those states who have held on to the union with the belief that their Southern sisters were hastily and wrong in their beliefs that they were about to be brought under an abolition government will now see that they were right and that 
all their worst apprehensions have been justified by the acts of that government. Beauregard sent an impudent telegram to Miles at Richmond. Has the bill for the execution of abolition prisoners after January next been passed? Do it, and England will be stirred into action. Let the execution be with the garrote. The reaction to emancipation in the North was unfavorable so far as political results indicated, although many motives influenced the voters. The election of 1862 in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois went Democratic. And in the other parts of the West, Lincoln lost support. In the Congress of 1860, there was 78 Republicans and 37 Democrats. And in the 1862, the administration had only 57 supporters with 67 in the opposition. Only among Negroes and in England was the reaction favorable and both counted. The proclamation made four and a half million laborers willing almost in mass to sacrifice their last drop of blood for their, their newfound country. It sent them into transports of joy and sacrifice. It changed all their pessimism and despair into boundless faith. It was the coming of the Lord. The proclamation had an undoubted and immediate effect upon England. The upper classes were strongly in favor of the Confederacy and sure that the Yankees were fighting only for a high tariff and hurt vanity. Free trade England was repelled by his, this program and attracted by the free trade which the Confederacy offered. There was strong demand among manufacturers to have the government interfere and recognize the Southern states as an independent nation. The church and universities were in favor of the Confederacy and all the great periodicals, even the philanthropists like Lord Shaftesbury, Carlyle, Buxton, Gladstone, threw their sympathies to the South. Carlyle sneered at people, cutting each other's throats because one half of them preferred hiring their servants for life and the other by the hour. As Henry Adams assures us, London was altogether beside itself on one point in a special. It created a nightmare of its own and gave it the shape of Abraham Lincoln. Behind this is placed another demon, if possible more devilish, and called it Mr. Seward. In regards to these two men, English society seemed demented. Defense was useless. Explanation was vain. One could only let the passion exhaust itself. One's best friends were as unreasonable as enemies. For the belief in poor Mr. Lincoln's brutality and Seward's ferocity became a dogma of popular faith. Confederate warships were being built and harbored in English ports, and in September 1862, Palmerston, believing that the Confederates were about to capture Washington, suggested intervention to members of his cabinet. Lord John Russell won attacked immediately, but the rebels were driven back at Antietam. That same month, a preliminary emancipation proclamation appeared. Gladstone and Russell still tried to force intervention, but Palmerston hesitated. There was similar demand in France, but not as strong because cotton did not play so large a part. Nevertheless, the textile workers in both France and England were hard pressed by the cotton famine. Napoleon III was in favor of the South, but the mass of the French nation was not. Napoleon was assured by the Confederate government that a Southern alliance with French Mexico and a guarantee of Cuba could be had for the asking if French would recognize the Confederacy. No danger from the North was anticipated for Seward was certain to accept Napoleon's assurances of France's neutrality. Public opinion stood back of the English government and was on the whole in favor of the South, but Garrison and Douglas, by their visits, and later Harriet Beecher Stowe, had influenced the opinion of the middle and laboring classes. Nevertheless, it was reported in 1862, we find only here and there among the Englishmen, one who does not fantasize side with the slave states. Various meetings in favor of the South are arranged by the working men of the General Council of Working Men's Association opposed the pro-Southern movement. The war had created a great society of cotton, and in addition to this, there had already been an overproduction of the cotton industry in England in 1860. 
so that the effects of the blockade were not felt until later, so far as the sale of goods were concerned. But the factories closed, and more than half the looms and spindles lay idle, especially in Lancaster. There was great distress among laborers. Fever and prostitution were prevalent in 1865. Notwithstanding this, the English workers stood up for the abolition of Negro slavery and protested against the intervention of English. Up until 1863, it was argued with some show of right that the North was not fighting to free the slaves, but on the contrary, according to Lincoln's own hands, was perfectly willing to settle the war and leave the Negroes in slavery. But as soon as Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, the working men of England held hundreds of meetings all over the country and in the industrial sections and hailed his action. Ernest Jones, the leader of the Cherist movement, raised his eloquent voice against slavery. During the winter of 1862 to 1863, meeting after meeting in favor of emancipation was held. The reaction in England to the Emancipation Proclamation was too enthusiastic for the government to dare take any radical step. Great meetings in London and Manchester stirred the nation and gave notice to Palmerston that he could not yet take the chance of recognizing the South. In spite of Russell and Gladstone, he began to withdraw. And the imminent danger of recognition of the South by England and France passed. In the monster meeting of English working men in St. James Hall, London, March 26, 1863, John Bright spoke and John Stuart Mill declared that higher political and social freedom had been established in the United States. Karl Marx testified that this meeting held in 1863 kept Lord Palmerston from declaring war against the United States. On December 31st, 1863, at meetings held simultaneously in London and Manchester, addresses were sent to Lincoln drafted by Karl Marx. The London address said, Sir, we who offer this address are Englishmen and working men. We prize our dearest inheritance brought for us by the blood of our fathers, the liberty we enjoy, the liberty of free labor on a free soil. We have therefore been accustomed to regard with veneration and gratitude the founders of the great republic in which the liberties of the Anglo-Saxon race have been widened beyond all precedents of the old world, and in which there are nothing to condemn or to lament but the slavery and degradation of men guilty only of a colored skin or an African parentage. We have looked with admiration and sympathy upon the brave, generous, and untiring efforts of a large party of the Northern States to deliver the Union from the curse and shame. We rejoice, sir, in your election to the presidency as a splendid proof that the principles of universal freedom and equality were rising to the ascendant. We regarded with abhorrence the conspiracy and rebellion by which it was sought at once to overthrow the supremacy of a government based upon the most popular suffrage in the world and to perpetuate the hateful inequalities of race. The Manchester Address adopted by 6,000 people said among other things, one thing alone has in the past lessened our sympathy with our country and our confidence in it. We mean the ascendancy of politicians who not merely maintain Negro slavery, but desire to extend and root it more deeply since we have discerned, however, that the victory of the free North in the war, which has so sorely distressed us as well as afflicted you, will shake off the fetters of the slave. You have attracted our warm and earnest sympathy. We joyfully honor you as the president and the Congress with you for the many decisive steps towards practically exemplifying your belief in the words of your great founder all men are created free and equal. We assume that you cannot now stop short of a complete uprooting of slavery. It would not become us to dictate any details, but there are broad principles of humanity which must guide you. If complete emancipation in some states be deferred, though only to predetermined day, still in the interval human beings should not be counted chattels. Women must have rights of chastity and maternity, men the right of husbands, masters the liberty of manumission. Justice demands for the blacks no less than for the white. The protection of the law, that is, his voice may be heard in your courts. Nor must any such abomination be tolerated as slave breeding states and as a slave market. If you are to earn high reward of all your sacrifices in the approval of the universal brotherhood and of the divine father. 
It is for your free country to, to decide whether anything but immediate and total emancipation can secure the most indispensable rights of humanity against the inveterate wickedness of local laws and local executives. We implore you for your own honor and welfare not to faint in your providential mission. While your enthusiasm is aflame and the tide of events runs high, let the work be finished effect effectually. Leave no root of bitterness to spring up and work fresh misery to your children. It is a mighty task indeed to reorganize the industry, not only the four millions of the colored race, but the five millions of whites. Nevertheless, the vast progress you have made in the short space of 20 months fills us with hope that every stain of your freedom will shortly be removed and that the erasure of the foul blot upon civilization and Christianity, chattel slavery, during your presidency will cause the name of Abraham Lincoln to be honored and revered by posterity. Lincoln in reply said that he knew the suffering of the working men in Manchester and Europe in this crisis and appreciated the action of the English working men as an example of sublime Christian heroism, which has not surpassed in any age or in any country. He declared that the Civil War was the attempts to overthrow his government, which was built upon a foundation of human rights and the substitute one, which should rest exclusively on the basis of human slavery. In the North, the Emancipation Proclamation meant the Negro soldier and the Negro soldier meant the end of the war. We have come to set you free, cried the black cavalrymen who rode at the head of the Union Army as it entered Richmond in 1864. These soldiers were in the division of Godfrey Weitzel when Ben Butler first assigned Negro troops to Weitzel's command in Louisiana. Weitzel resigned. It was a good thing for him that he recalled this resignation, for his black soldier at Port Hudson wrote his name in history. Here was indeed revolution. At first, this was to be a white man's war. First, because the North did not want to affront the South, and the war was going to be short very short. And secondly, if Negroes fought in the war, how could it help being a war for their emancipation? And for this, the North would not fight. Yet scarcely a year after hostilities started, the Negroes were fighting, although unrecognized as soldiers. In two years, they were free and enrolling in the army. Private Miles O'Reilly expressed in the newspapers a growing public opinion. Some say it in a burden shame, to make the niggers fight. And that the thread o' being kilt belongs but to the white. But as for me upon me soul, so liberal are we here. I'll let sample me murdered in place o' myself on every day in the year. In December 1861, Union officers were offered not to return fugitive slaves on pain of court martial. In 1862 came hunters Black Regiment in South Carolina. In the spring of 1862, General Hunter had less than 11,000 men under his command and had to hold the whole broken seacoast of Georgia, South Carolina, and Florida. He applied often and in vain to the authorities of Washington for reinforcements. All the troops available in, North, in the North were less than sufficient for General McClellan's great operation against Richmond and the reiterated answer of the War Department was, you must get along as best you can. Not a man from the North can be spared. No reinforcements to be had from the North. Vast fatigue duties and throwing up earthworks imposed on our insufficient garrison. The enemy continually increasing, both in insolence and numbers. Our only success, the capture of Fort Pulaski, sealing up Savannah, and this victory offset if not fully counterbalanced by many minor gains of the enemy. This was about the condition of affairs as seen from the headquarters fronting Port Royal Bay. When General Hunter, one morning, with twirling glasses, puckered lips, and dilated nostrils, he had just received another don't bother us reinforcements dispatch from Washington, announced his intention of forming a Negro regiment and compelling every able-bodied black man in the department to fight for the freedom, which could not be but the issue of our war. Hunter caused all the necessary orders to be issued and took it upon himself 
the responsibility for the irregular issue of arms, clothing, equipments, and rations involving in collecting and organizing the first experimental Negro regiments. Reports of the organization of the 1st Carolina Infantry were forwarded to headquarters in Washington, and the War Department took no notice. Nothing was said, nor was any authority given to pay the men or furnish them subsistence. But at last, a special dispatch steamer plowed her way over the bar with word from the War Department requiring immediate answer. It was a demand for information in regard to the Negro Regiment based on a resolution introduced by Woodcliffe of Kentucky. These resolutions had been adopted by Congress, Hunter laughed, but as he was without authority for any of his actions in this case, it seemed to worry his adjutant general that the documents in his hands were no laughing matter, but Hunter declared, that old fool has just given me the very chance I was growing sick for. The War Department has refused to notice my black regiment. But now, in reply to this resolution, I can lay the matter before the country and force the authorities either to adopt my Negroes or to disband them. So Hunter wrote, no regiment of fugitive slaves has been or is being organized in this department. There is, however, a fine regiment of loyal persons whose late masters are fugitive rebels. He said that he did this under instructions given by the late Secretary of War and his general authority to employ all loyal persons offering their service in defense of the Union, he added. Neither have I had any specific authority for supplying these persons with shovels, spades, pickaxes, when employing them as laborers, nor with boats and oars, when using them as lightermen, but there are no points included in Mr. Wycliffe's resolutions. To me, it seemed that liberty to employ men in any particular capacity implied and carried with it liberty. Also to support them with the necessary tools and acting upon this faith, I have clothed, equipped, and armed the only loyal regiment yet raised in South Carolina, Georgia, or Florida. The experiment of arming the blacks, so far as I have made it, has been a complete and even marvelous success. They are sober, docile, attentive, enthusiastic displaying great natural capacities in acquiring the duties of the soldier. They are now eager beyond all things to take the field and be led into action. And it is this unanimous opinion of the officers who have had charge of them that in the peculiarities of this climate in the country, they will prove invaluable auxiliaries, fully equal to the similar regiments so long and successfully used by the British authorities in the West India Islands. In conclusion, I would say it is my hope there appearing no possibility of other reinforcements. Owing to it, the exigencies of the campaign to the peninsula to have organized by the end of next fall and be able to present to the government from the 48 to 50,000 of, the, of these hardy and devoted soldiers. When the reply was read in the House of Representatives that its effects are magical, the clerk could scarcely read it with decorum nor could half his words be heard amidst universal peals of laughter in which both Democrats and Republicans appeared to vie as to which should be the more noisy. It was the great joke of the day, and coming at a moment of universal gloom in the public mind, was seized upon by the whole loyal press of the country as a kind of political-military champagne cocktail. When the Confederate government heard of this, it issued an order reciting that as the government of the United States had refused to answer whether it authorized the raising of the black regiment by General Hunter or not. Said general, his staff, and all officers under, under his command, who had directly or indirectly participated in the unclean thing, should hereafter be outlaws, not covered by the laws of war, but to be executed as felons for the crime of inciting Negro insurrections wherever caught. In Louisiana, the colored Creoles in many cases hesitated. Some of them had been owners of slaves and some actually fought in the Confederate army, but were not registered as Negroes. On November 23, 1861, the Confederate Grand Parade took place in New Orleans and one feature of the review was a regiment of free men of color, 1,400 in number. The Picayune speaks of a letter review on February 9, 1862. We may pay deserve compliment to the companies of free men of color, all well-dressed, well-drilled, and comfortably uniformed. 
Most of those companies have provided themselves with arms, unaided by the administration. When Butler entered the city in 1862, the Confederates fled tumultuously or laid aside their uniforms and stayed. The Free Negro Regiment did neither, but offered its services to the Federal Army. Butler, at first, was in a quandary. The instructions given by General McClellan to General Butler were silent on this most perplexing problem. On leaving Washington, Butler was verbally informed by the president that the government was not yet prepared to announce a Negro policy. They were anxiously considering the subject and hoped long to arrive at conclusions. Butler found the Negroes of great help to him, but he could not, as in Virginia, call them contraband because he had no work for them. He wanted to free them, but on May, May 9th, the news came that Hunter's proclamation in South Carolina had been revoked. Butler, however, abolished the whipping houses and encouraged the Negroes who called on him. One consequence was that the general had, had a spy in every house, behind each rebel chair, and, and he sat at the table. General Butler asked for reinforcements all summer on account of the growing strength of Vicksburg and, and Port Hudson, the conditions of mobile and camps near New Orleans. The answer from Washington was, we cannot spare you one man. We will send you men when we have them to send. You must hold New Orleans by all means and at all hazards. Earlier, General Phelps, who commanded the federal forces about seven miles from New Orleans, had received a number of refugees, some of them in chains and some of them bleeding from wounds. Butler ordered him, May 23rd, 1862, to exclude these from his lines. He replied at length. Added to the four million of the colored race, whose disaffection is increasingly even more rapidly than their number, there are at least four million more the white race whose growing miseries will naturally seek companionship with those of the blacks. He demanded that the president should abolish slavery and that Negroes be armed. Butler forwarded Phelps's reply to Washington. Phelps again demanded the right to arm Negro troops. He was ordered July 1st, 1862 to use the Negroes to cut wood. He immediately handed in his resignation saying, I'm willing to prepare African regiments for the defense of the government against its assailants. I'm not willing to become the mere slave driver which you propose, having no qualifications in that way. The use of Negro troops was precipitated by the attack which Breckinridge made August 5th, 1862 on Baton Rouge. Butler had to have troops to defend New Orleans and had applied to Washington, but none could be sent. Therefore, by proclamation, August 22nd, 1862, Butler called on Africa, accepted the Freed Negro Regiment, which had offered its services, and proceeded to organize other Negro troops. He recited at length the previous actions of the Confederate governor in organizing the Negro Regiment, April 23rd, 1861, and quoted directly from the Confederate governor's proclamation. Now, therefore, the commanding general, believing that a large portion of this militia force of the state of Louisiana are willing to take service in the volunteer forces of the United States and be enrolled and organized to defend their homes from ruthless invaders, to protect their wives and children and kindred from wrong and outrage, to shield their property from being seized by bad men, and to defend the flag of their native country as their fathers did under Jackson at Chalmette against Pakenham and his myrmidons, carrying the black flag of beauty and booty. Appreciating their motives, relying upon their well-known loyalty and patriotism, and with praise and respect for these brave men, it is ordered that all the members of the native guards, aforesaid, and all other free colored citizens recognized by the first and late governor and, and authorities of the state of Louisiana, as a portion of the militia of the state, who shall enlist in the volunteer service of the United States, shall be duly organized by the appointment of proper officers and accepted, paid, equipped, armed, and rationed as are other volunteer troops of the United States, subject to the approval of the President of the United States. Thousands of volunteers under Butler's appeal appeared. In 14 days, a regiment was organized with colored line officers and white field officers. More than half of the privates were not really free Negroes, a fugitive slaves. A second regiment with colored line officers was enlisted and a third with colored mess officers. 
In the Kansas Home Guard were two regiments of Indians, and among them over 400 Negroes, and 2,500 Negroes served in the contingent that came from the Indian nations, many of them enlisted early in 1862. In the meantime, the war was evidently more than a dress parade or, or a quick attack upon Richmond. 100,000 three-month soldiers were but a drop in the bucket. More and more troops must be had. The time of enlistment for many of the white troops was already expiring, and at least Negro troops could be used on fatigue duty in the large stretches of territory held by the federal armies down the Atlantic coast and in the Mississippi Valley and in the border states. Senator Henry Wilson of Massachusetts, chairman of the Senate Committee on Military Affairs, introduced a bill in, in July 1862, which empowered the president to accept Negroes for constructing entrenchments or any other war service for which they might be found competent. If owned by rebels, such Negroes were to be freed but nothing was said of their families. Thaddeus Stevens championed the bill in the House, and it was signed by Lincoln July 17, 1862. The debate was bitter. Senator Sherman of Ohio said, the question rises whether the people of the United States struggling for national existence should not employ these blacks for the maintenance of the government. The policy here too, pursued by the office of the, of the United States has been to repeal this class of people from our lives, to refuse their services. They would have made the best spies and yet they have been driven from our lines. Pheasanton of Maine added, I tell the general of our army, they must refer us to practices in their course of proceeding on this subject. I advise it here from my place, treat your enemies as enemies, as the worst of enemies and avail yourself like men of every power which God has placed in your hands to accomplish your purpose within the rules of civilized warfare. Race of Minnesota declared that not many days can pass before the people of the United, United States North must decide upon one or two questions. We have either to acknowledge the South, the, we have either to acknowledge the Southern Confederacy as a free and independent nation and that speedily, or we have as speedily to resolve to use all the means given us by the Almighty to prosecute this war to a successful termination. The necessity for action has arisen. To hesitate is worse than criminal. The border states demurred, and Davis of Kentucky was especially bitter with threats. The bill finally was amended so as to pay the black soldier's bounty to his owner if he happened to be a slave. All that was simply permissive legislation. And for a time, the War Department did nothing. Some of the commanders in the field, however, began to move. On the other hand, Senator Davis of Kentucky tried in, in January, 1863, to stop the use of any national appropriations to pay Negro soldiers. This attempt was defeated on January 6, 1863. Five days after the Emancipation Proclamation, the Secretary of War authorized the governor of Massachusetts to raise two Negro regiments for three years service. These were the celebrated 54th and 55th Negro regiments, the first regularly authorized Negro regiments of the war. The recruiting of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment of Colored Men was completed by the 13th of May. It has been planned to have the regiment pass through New York, but the chief of police warned that it would be subject to insult so that it went by sea to South Carolina. In October, the adjutant general of the United States issued a general order permitting the military employment of Negroes. The Union League Club of New York appointed a committee to raise Negro troops, and after some difficulty with Governor Seymour, they received from Washington authority to raise a regiment. 1,000 Negroes responded within two weeks, and by January 27, 1864, a second regiment was raised. No bounty was offered. No protection promised their families. One of the regiments marched through the city. The scene of yesterday, says the New York paper, was one which marks an era of progress in the political and social history of New York. A thousand men with black skins and clad and equipped with the uniforms and arms of the United States government marched from their camp to the most aristocratic and busy streets, received a grand ovation at the hands of the wealthiest and most respectable ladies and gentlemen of New York, and then moved down Broadway to the steamer which bears them to their destination. 
all of them, the enthusiastic cheers, the encouraging plaudits, the waving handkerchiefs, the showering bouquets, and the other approving manifestations of a hundred thousand of the most loyal of our people. Pennsylvania was especially prominent in recruiting Negro troops. A committee was appointed which raised $33,388, which, which would they propose to raise three regiments. The committee founded Camp William Penn at Shelton Hill, and the first squad went into camp June 26, 1863. The first regiment, known as the Third United States, was full July 24th, 1863. The third regiment, known as the English United States, was full December 4th. 1863. Two more regiments were full January 6th and February 3rd. The regiments went south August 13th, October 14th, 1863, and January 16th, 1864. In the Department of Cumberland, the Secretary of War authorized George L. Stearns of Massachusetts to recruit Negroes. Stearns was a friend of uh, John Brown and a prominent abolitionist. He took up a headquarters at Nashville and raised a number of regiments. In the Department of the Gulf, General Banks, May 1st, 1863, proposed an army corps to be known as the Corps d'Afrique. It was to consist of 18 regiments, infantry, artillery, and cavalry, and to be organized in three divisions of three brigades, each with engineers and hospitals, etc. He said, he said in his order, The government makes use of mules, horses, uneducated and educated white men in the defense of its institutions. Why should not the Negro contribute whatever it in his power for the cause in which he, he is as deeply interested as, as other men. We may properly demand from him whatever service he can render. In March 1863, the Secretary of War sent the Adjutant General Lorenzo Thomas into the South on a tour of inspection. Stanson's orders said, The President desires that you should confer freely with Major General Grant and the officers with whom you may have communication and explain to them the importance attached by the government to the use of the colored population emancipated by the president's proclamation and particularly for the organization of their labor and military strength. You are authorized in this connection to issue in the name of this department letters of appointment for field and company officers and to organize such troops for military services to the utmost extent to which they can be obtained in, in, in accordance with the rules and regulations of the service. Thomas spoke to the army officers in Louisiana and expressed himself clearly. You know full well, for you have been over this country, that the rebels have sent into the fields all their available fighting men, every man capable of bearing arms. And you know they have kept at home all their slaves for raising the subsistence for their armies in the field. In this way, they can bring to bear against us all the strength of their so-called Confederate states. While we at the North can only send a portion of our fighting force, being compelled to leave behind another portion to cultivate our fields and supply the wants of an immense army, the administration has determined to take from the rebels this source of supply, to take their Negroes and compel them to send back a portion of their whites to cultivate their deserted plantations. And every poor person's they would be to fill the place of the dark hued labor. They must do this or their armies will starve. All of you someday will be on picket duty and I charge you all, if any of this unfortunate race comes within your lines that you do not turn them away, but receive them kindly and cordially. They are to be encouraged to come to us. They are to be received with open arms. They are to be fed and clothed. They are to be armed. It would not have been American, however, not to have maintained some color discrimination, however petty. First, there was the matter of pay. The pay of soldiers at the beginning of the war was $13 a month. Negro soldiers are listed under the same law. In the instructions of General Saxon, August 25th, 1862, it was stated that the pay should be the same as that of the other troops. Soon, however, this was changed and the Negro soldiers were allowed but $10 a month, and three of this was deducted for clothing. Many of the regiments refused to receive the reduced pay. The 54th Massachusetts Infantry refused pay for a whole year until the regiment was treated as other regiments. The state of Massachusetts made up the difference to disabled and discharged soldiers until June 15, 1864, when the law was changed. In the Department of the Gulf, white troops 
who did provost duties about this city were paid $16 a month, while the Negro regiments were paid $7. At one time, this came near causing a mutiny. The Negroes did not waver. John M. Langston, in a speech in Ohio in August 1862, said, Pay or no pay, let us volunteer. The good results of such a course are manifold. But this one alone is all that needs to be mentioned in this connection. I refer to thorough organization. This is the great need of the colored Americans. With regard to officers, the people of Pennsylvania secured from the Secretary of War permission to establish a free military school for the education of candidates for commissioned officers among the colored troops. The school was established and within less than six months examined over a thousand applicants and passed 560. In the Department of the Gulf, Butler was in favor of colored officers because the first colored regiment, there were a number of well-trained and intelligent Negro officers, but Banks was very much against colored officers. I would not use them. There was at first a great distaste on the part of the white man for serving in colored regiments. Hunter found this difficulty with his first regiment, but he quickly cured it by offering commissions to competent non-commissioned officers. Later, when the black troops made their reputation in battle, the chance to command them was eagerly sought. Congress finally freed the wives and children of enlisted soldiers, a measure which Davis of Kentucky quickly opposed on the grounds that the government had no power to take private property except for public use and without just compensation to the owner. Abraham Lincoln, under a fire of criticisms, warmly defended the enlistment of Negro troops. The slightest knowledge of arithmetic will prove to any man that the rebel armies cannot be destroyed with democratic strategy. It would sacrifice all the white men of the North to do it. There are now in the service of the United States near 200,000 able-bodied colored men, most of them under arms defending and acquiring Union territory. Abandon all the posts now garrisoned by black men, take 200,000 men from our side and put them in the battlefield or cornfield against us. And we would be compelled to abandon the war in three weeks. My enemies pretend I'm now carrying on this war for the sole purpose of abolition. So long as I am president, it shall be carried on for the sole purpose of restoring the union. But no human power can subdue this rebellion without the use of emancipation policy and every other policy calculated to weaken the moral and physical forces of the rebellion. Freedom has given us 200,000 men raised on Southern soil. It will give us more yet, just so much as it has subtracted from the enemy. The question as to whether Negroes should enlist in the federal army was not nearly as clear in 1863 as it seems today. The South still refused to believe that the Civil War would end in the emancipation of slaves. There not only were strong declarations to the contrary in the North, but there was still the determined opposition of the border states. The Confederates industriously spread propaganda among slaves, alleging that Northern, Northerners mistreated the Negroes and were selling them to the West Indies into harsher slavery. Even the North, among the most intelligent free Negroes, there was some hesitancy. Frederick Douglass spoke for the free and educated black man, clear headed and undeceived. Now, what is the attitude of Washington government toward the colored race? What reasons have we to desire its triumph in the present contest? Mind, I do not ask what was its attitude toward us before his bloody rebellion broke out. I do not ask what was its disposition when it was controlled by the very man who are now fighting to destroy it when they could no longer control it. I do not even ask what it was two years ago when McClellan shamelessly gave out that in a war between loyal slaves and disloyal masters, he would take the side of the masters against the slaves when he openly proclaimed his purpose to put down slave insurrections with an iron hand when glorious Ben Butler now stunned into a conversation to anti-slavery principles, which I have every reason to believe sincere, preferred his services to the governor of Maryland to suppress a slave insurrection while treason ran riot in, the, in that state and the warm red blood of Massachusetts soldiers still stained the pavements of Baltimore. I do not ask what was the attitude of this government when many of the officers and men who had undertaken to defend it openly threatened to throw down their arms and leave the service if, if men of color 
should weep forward to defend it and be invested with the dignity of soldiers. Moreover, I do not ask what was the position of the government when our loyal camps were, were made slave hunting grounds and United States officers performed the disgusting duty of slave dogs to hunt down slaves for rebel masters. These were all the dark and terrible days for the Republic. I do not ask you about the dead past. I bring you the living present. Events more mighty than men, eternal providence, all wise and controlling, have placed us in new relations to the government and the government to us. What that government is to us today and what it will be tomorrow is made evident by a very few facts. Look at them, colored men. Slavery in the District of Columbia is abolished forever. Slavery in all the territories of the United States is abolished forever. The foreign slave trade, with its 10,000 revolting abominations, is, is rendered impossible. Slavery in 10 states of the Union is abolished forever. Slavery in f the five remaining states is, a, is as certain to follow the same fate as the night is to follow the day. The independence of Haiti is recognized. Her minister sits beside our prime minister, Mr. Seward, and dines at a stable in Washington, while colored men are excluded from the cars in Philadelphia, showing that a black man's complexion in Washington, in the presence of the federal government, is less offensive than in the city of brotherly love. Citizenship is no longer denied us under this government. Under the interpretation of our rights by Attorney General Bates, we are American citizens. We can import goods, own and sail ships and travel in foreign countries with American passports in our pockets. And now so far from there being any opposition, so far from excluding us from the army as soldiers, the president at Washington, the cabinet and the Congress, the generals commanding and the whole army of the nation unite in giving us one thunderous welcome to share with them in honor and glory of suppressing treason and upholding the Star Spangled Banner. The revolution is tremendous and it becomes us as wise men to recognize the change and to shape our actions accordingly. I hold that the federal government will never, in its essence, anything but an anti-slavery government. Abolish slavery tomorrow and not a sentence or syllable of the Constitution need be altered. It was purposely so framed as to give no claim, no sanction to the claim of property in man. If in its origin slavery had any relation to the government, it was only as the scaffolding to the magnificent structure to be removed as soon as the building was completed. There is in the Constitution no East, no West, no North, no South, no Black, no White, no Slave, no Slaveholder, but all our citizens who are of American birth. Such is the government, fellow citizens, you are now called upon to uphold with your arms. Such is the government that you are called upon to cooperate with enduring rebellion and slavery in common grave. Never since the world began was a better chance offered to a long enslaved and oppressed people. The opportunity is given us to be men. With one courageous resolution, we may blot out the handwriting of ages against us. Once let the black man get upon his person the brass letters U.S. Let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket. And there is no power on earth or under the earth which can deny that he has earned the right of citizenship in the United States. In the meantime, two fateful occurrences took place. First, the white workers of New York declared in effect that the Negroes were the cause of the war and that they were tired of the discrimination that made workers fighters for the rich. They therefore killed all the Negroes that they could lay their hands on. On the other hand, in Louisiana and South Carolina, Negro soldiers were successfully used in pitched battle. The opposition to the war in the North took various forms. There was the open sedition led by Vallandigham, and ending in the mass opposition of the working class. This Copperhead movement was pro-slavery and pro-Southern, and was met in part by close understanding and alliance between the abolitionists and the Republican administration. But the working class movement was deeper and more difficult. It was the protest of the poor against being compelled to fight the battles of the rich, in which they could conceive no interest of theirs. If the workers had been inspired by the sentiment against slavery with which animated the English workers, results might have been different. But the Copperheads of the North and the commercial interests of New York in particular were enabled to turn the just indignation of, of workers against Negro laborers rather than against the capitalist and against any war, even for emancipation. When the draft law passed in 1863, it meant that the war could no longer be carried on with volunteers 
that soldiers were going to be compelled to fight and these soldiers were going to be poor men who could not buy exemption. The result throughout the country was widespread disaffection that went often as far as rioting. More than 2,500 deserters from the Union Army were returned to the ranks from Indianapolis alone during a single month in 1862. The total desertions in the North must have been several hundred thousand. It was easy to transfer class hatred so that it fell upon the black workers. The end of the war seemed far off and the attempt to enforce the draft led particularly to disturbances in New York City, where a powerful part of the city press was not only against the draft, but against the war and in favor of the South and Negro slavery. The establishment of the draft undertaken July 13th in New York City met everywhere with resistance. Working men engaged in tearing down buildings were requested to give their names for the draft. They refused and drove away the officers. The movement spread over the whole city. Mobs visited workshops and compelled the men to stop work. Firemen were prevented from putting out fires. Telegraph riders were cut. And then at last, the whole force of the riot turned against the Negroes. They were the cause of the war and hence the cause of the draft. They were bidding for the same jobs as white men. They were underbidding white workers in order to keep themselves from starving. They were disliked especially by the Irish because of direct economic competition and difference in religion. The democratic press had advised the people that they were to be called upon to fight the battles of niggers and abolitionists. Governor Seymour politely requested the riders to await the return of the adjutant general, whom he had dispatched to Washington to ask the president to suspend the draft. The report of the Merchants Committee on the draft riot says of the Negroes, driven by the fear of death at the hands of the mob, who the week previous had, you remember, brutally murdered and hanging on trees and lampposts, several of their number and cruelly beaten and robbed many others, burning and sacking their houses, driving nearly all from the streets, alleys, and docks upon which they had previously obtained an honest, though humble living. These people had been forced to take refuge on Blackwell's Island, at police stations, on the outskirts of the city, in the swamps and woods, back of Bergen, New Jersey, at Weeksville, and in the barns and outhouses of the farmers of Long Island and Morrisania. At these places were scattered some 5,000 homeless men, women, and children. The whole demonstration became anti-union and pro-slavery. Attacks were made at the residence of Horace Greeley, and cheers were heard for Jefferson Davis. The police fought it at first only half-heartedly and with sympathy, and finally with brutality. Soldiers were summoned from Fort Hamilton, West Point, and elsewhere. The property loss was put at $1,200,000. And it was estimated that between 400 and 1,000 people were killed. When 1,000 troops under General Wool took charge of the city, 13 rioters were killed, 18 wounded, 24 made prisoners. Four days the riots lasted, and the city appropriated $2,500,000 to indemnify the victims. In many other places, riots took place, although they did not become so specifically race riots. They did, however, show the North that unless they could replace unwilling white soldiers with black soldiers who had a vital stake in the outcome of the war, the war could not be won. It had been a commonplace thing in the North to declare that Negroes would not fight. Even the black man's friends were skeptical about the possibility of using him as a soldier and far from it, and far from it being to the credit of black men or any men that they did not want to kill, the ability and willingness to take human life has always been, even in the minds of liberal men, a proof of manhood. It took in many respects a finer type of courage for the Negro to work quietly and faithfully as a slave while the world was fighting over his destiny than it did to seize a bayonet and rush mad with fury or inflamed with drink and plunge it into the bowels of a stranger. Yet this was the proof of manhood required by the Negroes. He might plead his cause with the tongue of Frederick Douglass and the nation listened almost unmoved. He might labor for the nation's wealth and the nation took the result without thanks and handed him as near nothing in return as would keep him alive. He was called a coward and a fool when he protected the women and children of his master. 
But when he rose and fought and killed, the whole nation with one voice proclaimed him a man and a brother. Nothing else made emancipation possible in the United States. Nothing else made Negro citizenship conceivable but the record of Negro soldier as a fighter. The military aid of the Negroes began as laborers and as spies. A soldier said, this war has been full of records of Negro agency in our behalf. Negro guides have piloted our forces. Negro sympathy cared for our prisoners escaping from the enemy. Negro hands have made us naval captures. Negro spies brought us valuable information. The Negroes of the South have been in sympathy with us from the beginning and have always hailed the approach of our flag with the wildest demonstrations of joy. All through the war and after, Negroes were indispensable as informers, as is well known. The Southern papers had repeated notices of the work of Negro spies. In Richmond, a white woman with dispatches for the Confederate Army was arrested in 1863 on information given by a Negro. At the Battle of, of Manassas, the House of Free Negro was used as a refuge for the dead and wounded Union men. Negro pilots repeatedly guided federal boats in Southern waters, and there were several celebrated cases of whole boats being seized by Negro pilots. A typical instance of this type was the action of William F. Tillman, a colored steward on board the brig S.J. Waring, which carried a cargo value of $100,000. He is succeeded by leading a revolt and freeing the vessel from the Confederates who had seized it, and with the aid of a German and Canadian had brought the vessel into the port of New York. This action brought up the question of whether a Negro could be a master of a vessel. In the official opinions of the Attorney General for 1862, it was declared that a free colored man, if born in the United States, was a citizen of the United States, and that he was competent to be a master of a vessel engaged in the coasting trade. The case of Smalls and the Planter at Charleston, South Carolina became almost classic. Quote, while at the wheel of the planter as pilot in the rebel service, it occurred to me that I could not only secure my own freedom, but that of numbers of my comrades in bonds, and moreover, I thought the planter might be of some use to Uncle Abe. I reported my plans for rescuing the planter from the rebel captain to the crew, all colored, and secured their secrecy and cooperation. On May 13th, 1862, we took on board several large guns at the Atlantic dock. At evening of that day, the captain went home, leaving the boat in my care, with instruction to send for him in case he should be wanted. At half past three o'clock in the morning of the 14th of May, I left the Atlantic dock with the planter, went to the Atau, took on board my family and several other families, then proceeded down Charleston River slowly. When opposite Fort Sumter at 4 a.m., I gave the signal, which was answered from the fort, thereby giving permission to pass. I then made speed for the blockading feet, and when entirely out of range of Sumter's guns, I hoisted a white flag, and at 5 a.m. reached a U.S. blockading vessel, commanded by Captain Nicholas, to whom I turned over the planter." Unquote. After Lincoln was assassinated, General Hancock appealed to Negroes for helping in capturing his murderers. Quote, your president has been murdered. He has fallen by the assassin and without a moment's warning, simply and solely because he was your friend and the friend of our country. Had he been unfaithful to you and to the great cause of human freedom, he might have lived. The pistol from which he met his death, though held by Booth, was held by the hands of treason and slavery. Think of this and remember how long and how anxiously this good man labored to break your chains and make you happy. I now appeal to you by every consideration which can move loyal and grateful hearts to aid in discovering and arresting his murderer." Unquote. This was issued on the 24th of April. On the next day, the cavalry and police force having crossed the Potomac received information from a colored woman that the, that the fugitives had been seen there. They were followed toward Bowling Green and then toward Port Royal. There, an old colored man reported that four individuals in company with a rebel captain had crossed the river to Bowling Green. This information brought the police to Garrett's house where Booth was found. Negro military labor had been indispensable to the Union armies. Quote, Negroes built most of the fortifications and earthworks for General Grant in front of Vicksburg. The works in and about Nashville were cast up by the strong arm and willing hand of the loyal blacks. 
Dutch Gap was dug by Negroes, and miles of earthworks, fortifications, and corduroy ro roads were made by Negroes. They did fatigue duty in every department of the Union Army. Wherever a Negro appeared with a shovel in his hand, a white soldier took his gun and returned to the ranks. There were 200,000 Negroes in the camps, an employ of the Union armies as servants, teamsters, cooks, and laborers. The South was, for a long time, convinced that the Negro could not and would not fight. Quote, the idea of their doing any serious fighting against white men is simply ridiculous, unquote, said an editorial in the Savannah Republican, March 25th, 1863. Of the actual fighting of Negroes, uh, a Union general, Morgan, afterward interested in Negro education, says, quote, History has not yet done justice to the share borne by colored soldiers in the war for the Union. Their conduct during that eventful period has been a silent but most potent factor in influencing public sentiment, shaping legislation, and fixing the status of colored people in America. If the records of their achievements could be put into shape, that they could be accessible to the thousands of colored, uh, colored youth in the South, they would kindle in their young minds an enthusiastic devotion to manhood and liberty. Unquote. Black men were repeatedly and deliberately used as shock troops when there were little or no when there was little or no hope of success. In February 1863, Colonel Thomas Wentworth Higginson led black troops into Florida and declared, quote, it would have been madness to attempt with the bravest white troops what successfully what, what successfully accomplished with black ones, unquote. In April, there were three white companies from Maine and seven Negro companies on ship on Ship Island, the key to New Orleans. The black troops with black officers were attacked by Confederates who outnumbered them five to one. The Negroes retreated so as to give the federal gunboat Jackson a chance to shell their pursuers, but the white crew disliked the Negro soldiers and opened fire directly upon the black troops while they were fighting the Confederates. <laughs> Major Dumas, the Negro officer in command, rescued the black men, repulsed the Confederates, and brought the men out safely. The commander called attention to these colored officers. Quote, they were constantly in the thickest of the fight and by their unflinching bravery and admirable handling of their commands contributed to the success of the attack and reflected great honor upon the flag. Unquote. A. The first battle with numbers of Negro troops followed soon after. Banks laid siege to Port Hudson with all his forces, including two black regiments. On May 23, 1863, the assault was ordered, but the various cooperating organizations did not advance simultaneously. The Negro regiments on the north made three desperate charges, losing heavily, but maintained the advance over a field covered with recently felled trees. Confederate batteries opened fire upon them. Michigan, New York, and Massachusetts white troops were hurled back, but the works had to be taken. Two Negro regiments were ordered to go forward through a direct and crossfire. The deeds of heroism performed, quote, the deeds of heroism performed by these colored men were such as the proudest white men might emulate. Their colors are torn to pieces by shot and literally bespattered by blood and brains. The color sergeant of the first Louisiana on being mortally wounded hugged the colors to his breast when a struggle ensued between the two color corporals on each side of him as to who should have the honor of bearing the sacred standard, and during this generous contention, one was seriously wounded. One black lieutenant actually mounted the enemy's works three or four times, and in one charge, the assaulting party crime with, uh, and, and in one charge, the assaulting party came within 50 paces of them. Indeed, if only ordinarily supported by artillery and reserve, no one can convince us that they would not have opened a passage through the enemy's works. Captain Kalu of the 1st Louisiana, a man so black that he actually prided himself upon his blackness, died the death of a hero leading on his men in the thickest of the fight. Colonel Bassett being driven back, Colonel Finnegus took his place and his men being similarly cut to, to pieces. Lieutenant Colonel Bassett reformed and recomm recommenced. And thus these brave people went on from morning until 3.30 p.m., under the most hideous carnage that men 
had ever had to withstand and that very few white ones would have, would have had nerve to encounter, even if ordered to. During this time, they rallied and were ordered to make six distinct charges, losing 37 killed and 155 wounded and 116 missing. The majority, if not all of these, being in all probability now lying dead on the gory field and without the rites of uh, sepulture. For when, by flag of truce, our forces in other direction were permitted to reclaim their dead, the benefit, through some neglect, was not extended to these black regiments. Unquote. In June came the Battle of Milliken's Bend. Grant in order to capture Vicksburg, had drawn nearly all his troops from Milliken's Bend except three Negro regiments and a small force of white cavalry. This force was surprised by the Confederates who drove the white cavalry to the very breastworks of the fort. Here the Confederates rested, expecting to take the fortifications in the morning. At three o'clock they rushed over with drawn bayonets, but the Negroes drove them out of the forts and held them until the, gun, until the gunboats came. One officer describes the fight, quote, before the colonel was ready, the men were in line, ready for action. As before stated, the rebels drove our force toward the gunboats, taking colored men prisoners and murdering them. This so enraged them that they rallied and charged the enemy more heroically and desperately than has been recorded during the war. It was a genuine bayonet charge, a hand-to-hand -hand fight that has never occurred to any extent during this prolonged conflict. Upon both sides, men were killed with the butts of muskets. White and black were lying side by side, pierced by bayonets, in some instances transfixed to the earth. In one instance, two men, one white and the other black, one instance, two men, one white and the other black, were found dead side by side, each having the other's bayonet through his body. In fact, in facts proved to be, oh, if facts prove to be what they are now represented, this engagement of Sunday morning will be recorded as the most desperate of this war. Broken limbs, broken heads, the mangling of bodies, all prove that it was a contest between enraged men. On the one side, from hatred to a race, and on the other, desire for self-preservation, revenge for past grievances, and the inhuman murder of their comrades. Unquote. The month of July, 1863, was memorable. General Meade had driven Lee from Gettysburg. Grant had captured Vicksburg. Banks had captured Port Hudson, and Gilmore had begun his operations on Morris Island. On the 13th of July, the draft riot broke out in New York City, and before it was over, a Negro regiment in South Carolina, the 54th Massachusetts, was preparing to lead the assault on Fort Wagner. It was a desperate, impossible venture, which failed but can never be forgotten. The Black 54th Massachusetts Regiment was <clears throat> to lead the assault. Quote, Wagner loomed black, grim, and silent. There was no glimmer of light. Nevertheless, in the fort, down below the level of the tide and under roofs made by huge trunks of trees, lay 2,000 Confederate soldiers hidden. Our troops advanced toward the, toward the fort, while our mortars... While our mortars, my page just flipped. In the rear, tossed bombs over their head. I found it. Uh, behind the 54th came five regiments from Connecticut, New York, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and Maine. The mass went quickly and silently in the night. Then suddenly the walls of the fort burst with a blinding sheet of vivid light. Shot. Shells of iron and bullets crushed through the dense masses of the attacking force. I shall never forget the terrible sound of that awful blast of death which swept down, battered or dead, a thousand of our men. Not a shot had missed its aim. Every bolt of iron and lead tasted of human blood. Goodness! The column wavered and recovered itself. They reached the ditch before the fort. They climbed on the ramparts ramparts and swarmed over the walls and looked as though the fort was captured. It, it looked as though the fort was captured. Then there came another blinding blaze from concealed guns in the rear of the fort and the men went down by scores. The rebels rallied and were reinforced by thousands of others who had landed on the beach in the darkness, unseen by the fleet. They hurled themselves upon the attacking force. The struggle was terrific. 
the sporting the supporting units hurried up to aid their comrades, but as they raised their ramparts, they fired a volley which struck down many of their own men. Our men rallied again, but were forced back to the edge of the ditch. Colonel Shaw, with scores of his black fighters, went down struggling desperately. Resistance was vain. The assailants were forced back to the breach, and the rebels drilled their recovered cannons anew on the remaining survivors. Ha! Unquote. Goodness gracious. Oh no, it continues. When a request was made for, was made for Colonel Shaw's body, a Confederate ma major said, We have buried him with his niggers. I'm going to read that one more time. When a request was made for Colonel Shaw's body, a Confederate major said, We have buried him with his niggers. In December 1863, Morgan led Negro troops in the Battle of Nashville. He declared a new chapter in the history of liberty. Um, he declared a new chapter in the history of liberty had been written. Quote, it had been shown that marching under a flag of freedom animated by a love of liberty, even the slave becomes a man and a hero. Unquote. Between eight and 10,000 Negro troops took part in the battles around Nashville, all of them from slave states. When General Thomas rode over the battlefield and saw the bodies of colored men side by side with foremost on the very works of the enemy, he turned, up, he turned to his staff saying, quote, gentlemen, the question is settled. Negroes will fight, unquote. I know that's right. Maybe not in a world, but we'll fight. Um, how extraordinary and what a tribute to ignorance and religious hypocrisy is the fact that in the minds of most people, even those of liberals, only murder makes men. The slave pleaded. He was humbled. He protected the women of the South. And the world ignored him. The slave killed white men. And behold, he was a man. Yo, let's read that one more time. How extraordinary and what a tribute to ignorance and religious hypocrisy is the fact that in the minds of most people, even those of liberals, only murder makes men. The slave pleaded. He was humbled. He protected the women of the South, and the world ignored him. The slave killed white men, and behold, he was a man. The New York Times said conservatively in 1863, quote, Negro soldiers have now been in battle at Port Hudson and at Milliken's Bend in Louisiana, at Helena in Arkansas, at, at Morris Island in South Carolina, and at or near Fort Gibson in the Indian, Indian Territory. In two of these instances, they assaulted fortified positions and led the assault. In two, they fought, fought on the defensive, and in one, they attacked rebel infantry. In all of them, they acted in conjunction with white troops and under command of white officers. In some instances, instances they acted with distinguished bravery, and in all, they acted as well as could be expected of raw troops. Unquote. Even the New York Herald wrote in May 1864, quote, the conduct of the colored troops, by the way, in the action of the last few days, is described as superb. An Ohio soldier said to me today, I never saw men fight with such desperate gallantry as those Negroes did. They advanced as grim and stern as death, and when within reach of the enemy struck about, uh, reach of the enemy struck about them with pitiless vigor, that was almost fear, uh, and within reach of the enemy struck about them with pitiless vigor, that was almost fearful. Another soldier said to me, these Negroes never shrink nor hold back, no matter what the order. Through scorching heat and pelting storms, if the order comes, they march with prompt, ready feet. Such praise is great praise, and it is deserved. Unquote. And there was a significant dispatch in the New York Tribune on July 26th. Um, quote, and speaking of the uh, soldierly qualities of our colored troops, I do not refer especially to their noble action in the perilous edge of the battle that is settled, but to their docility and their patience of labor and suffering in the camp and on the march. I'll read that again. And speaking of the soldierly qualities of our colored troops, I do not refer especially to their noble action in the perilous edge of the battle. That is settled, but 
to their docility and their patience of labor and suffering in the camp and on the march. Their patience of labor and suffering. Unquote. Grant was made Lieutenant General, General in 1864 and began to reorganize the armies. When he came east, he found that few Negro troops had been used in Virginia. He therefore transferred nearly 20,000 Negroes from the South and Western armies to the Army of Virginia. They fought in nearly all the battles around Peters, Petersburg and Richmond. The officers on the field reported, quote, the problem is solved. The Negro is a man a soldier, a hero. Knowing of your laudable interest in the colored troops, but particularly those raised under immediate auspices of the supervisory committee, I have thought it proper that I should let you know how they acquitted themselves in the late actions in front of Petersburg, of which you have already received newspaper accounts. If you remember, in my conversation, in my conversations upon the character of these troops, I carefully avoided saying anything about their fighting qualities till I could have an opportunity to to, of trying them." Unquote. When the Siege of Petersburg began, there were desperate battles the 16th, 17th, and 18th of June. The presence of Negro soldiers rendered the enemy especially spiteful, and there were continual scrimmages and sharpshooting. Burnside's Ninth Corps had a brigade of black troops who advanced within 50 yards of the enemy works. There was a small projecting fort which it was decided to mine and destroy. The colored troops were to charge after the mine was set off. An inspecting officer reported that the Black Corps Corp was the fittest for the perilous services, but Meade objected to colored troops leading the assault. Burnside insisted. The matter was referred to Grant, and he agreed with Meade. A white division led the assault and failed. The Battle of the Crater followed. Captain McCabe says... Quote, it was now 8 o'clock in the morning. The rest of the Potter's Federal Division moved out slowly when Ferrero's Negro Division, the men beyond question, inflamed with drink. There are many officers and men, men, myself among the number who will testify to this, burst from the advanced lines, cheering vehemently, passed at a double quick over a crest under a heavy fire, and rushed with scarcely a check over the heads of the white troops in the crater, spread to their right, and captured more than 200 prisoners in one stand of colors. General Grant afterwards said, General Burnside wanted to put his colored troops in front. I believe if he had done so, it would have been a success. <laughs> wow. Uh, contrary to what he said earlier, goodness. The following spring, April 3rd, the federal troops entered Richmond. Weitzel was leading with the black regiment in his command, a long blue line with gun barrels gleaming and, and bands playing. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, but his soul goes marching on. That's what they were playing. President Lincoln visited the city after the surrender, and the Connecticut Colored Troops, known as the 29th Colored Regiment, witnessed his entry. One member of this unit said, When the president landed, there was no carriage near. Neither did he wait for one, but leading his son, they walked over a mile to General Weitzel's headquarters at Jeff Davis's mansion, a colored man acting as a guide. What a spectacle. I never witnessed such rejoicing in all my life. As the president passed along the street, the colored people waved their handkerchiefs, hats, and bonnets, and expressed their gratitude by shouting repeatedly, Thank God for his goodness. We have seen his salvation. No wonder tears came to his eyes when he looked on the poor colored people who were once slaves and heard the blessings uttered from thankful hearts and thanksgiving to God and Jesus. After visiting Jefferson Davis's man mansion, he proceeded to the rebel capital and from the steps delivered a short speech and spoke to the colored people as follows. Quote from the president. In, re in reference to you, colored people, let me say God has made you free. Although you have been deprived of your God-given rights by your so-called masters, you are now as free as I am. And if those that claim to be your superiors do not know that you are free, Take the sword and bayonet and teach them that you are. For God created all men free, giving to each the same rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Unquote. 
The recruiting of Negro soldiers was hastened after the Battle of Fort Wagner until finally no less than 154 regiments designated as United States Negro troops were enlisted. They included 140 infantry regiments, seven cavalry regiments, 13 artillery regiments, and 11 separate companies and batteries. The whole number enlisted will never be accurately known since in the Department of the Gulf and elsewhere, there was a practice of putting a living Negro soldier in a dead one's placed under the same name. There was a practice of putting a living Negro soldier in a dead one's place under the same name. Uh, official figures say that there were all, there were in all 186,017 Negro troops of whom 123,156 were still in service. July 16, 1865, and that the losses during the war were 68,178. They took part in 198 battles and skirmishes, without doubt, including servants, laborers, and spies. Between three and 400,000 Negroes helped as regular soldiers or laborers in winning the Civil War. The world knows that noble inscription on St. Gaudens Shaw Monument in Boston Common, written by President Eliot. The White Officers. This is the inscription. Taking life and honor in their hands, cast their lot with men of a despised race unproved in war and risk death as inciters of a, of a servile insurrection of taken prisoners besides encountering all the common perils of camp, march, and battle. The black rank and file volunteered when disaster clouded the Union cause, served without pay for 18 months till given that of white troops, faced threatened enslavement if captured, were brave in action, patient under dangerous and heavy labors, and cheerful amid hardships and privations. Together, they gave to the nation undying proof that Americans of African descent possessed the pride, courage, and devotion of the Patriot soldier, 180,000 such Americans enlisted under the Union flag in a lot of Greek letters saying which year it was. Not only did Negroes fight in the ranks, but also about 75 served as commissioned officers and a large number as subalterns. Major F.E. Dumas, of Louisiana was a free Negro and a gentleman of education, ability, and property. He organized a whole company of his own slaves and was promoted to the rank of major. Many of the other Louisiana officers were well-educated. Among these officers were one major, 25 captains, and 38 lieutenants and nearly 100 non-commissioned officers. In the other colored regiments, most of the officers were whites, but Massachusetts commissioned 10 Negro officers and Kansas three. There were outside Louisiana, one Lieutenant Colonel, one major, two captains, two surgeons, and four lieutenants whose records are known. Um, whose records are known. There were a number of mulattoes who served as officers in white regiments. One was on the staff of Major General of Volunteers was on the staff of a major general of volunteers. Medals of honor were bestowed by the United States government for heroic conduct on the field of battle upon, uh, upon 14 Negroes. The Confederates furiously denounced the arming of Negroes. The Savannah Republican called Hunter the cold-blooded abolition miscreant, who from his headquarters at Hilton Head is engaged in executing the bloody and savage behests of the imperial gorilla, who from his throne of human bones at Washington rules, reigns, and riots over the destinies of the brutish and degraded North." Unquote. The officers in command of black troops were branded as outlaws. Hmm. If captured, they were to be treated as common felons. To be killed by a Negro was a shameful death. To be shot by the Irish and the Germans from northern city slums was humiliating. But for masters to face armed bodies of their former slaves was inconceivable. <laughs> when, therefore, black men were enrolled in northern armies, the Confederates tried to pillory the government, inter government internationally on the ground, and this was arming barbarians for servile war. 
In a message to the Confederate Congress, Jefferson Davis asked, quote, our fellow, our fellow men of all countries to pass judgment on a measure by which several millions of human beings of the inferior race, peaceful and contented laborers in their sphere, are doomed to extermination, while at the same time they are encouraged to a general assassination of their masters, masters by the insidious recommendation to abstain from violence unless in necessary defense. <sighs> our own detestation of those who had attempted the most execrable measures recorded in the history of guilty men is tempered by profound contempt for the impotent rage which it discloses. So far as regards the action of this government on such criminals as they may attempt its execution, I confine myself to inform you that I shall, unless in your wisdom you deem some other course expedient, deliver to the several state authorities all commissioned officers of the United States that may hereafter be captured by our forces in any of the states embraced by the proclamation that they be dealt with in accordance with the laws of those states providing for the punishment of criminals engaged in exciting servile insurrection. Unquote. In December 1862, he issued a pro proclamation, quote, that all Negro slaves captured in arms be at once delivered over to the executive authorities of the respective states to which they belonged and to be dealt with according to the law of the United States, unquote, which of course meant death. Man, after they had been the most excellent of, of all of all the soldiers, oh my gosh. <clears throat> uh, which, which of course meant death. The same month, the Confederate Congress passed resolutions confirming in the main the president's proclamation uh, ordering that commissioned officers commanding Negro troops be put to death by the Confederate government while the Negroes be turned over to the states. The fire of the Confederates was always concentrated upon the black troops and the Negroes captured suffered and the Negroes captured suffered indignities and cruelties. I'll bet they did. Goodness. Frederick Douglass, who visited the White House in the president's carriage to take tea, appealed in, on, in behalf of his fellow blacks. If they served in federal uniform, he said that they should receive the treatment of prisoners of war. This treatment of Negro soldiers brought rebuke from Abraham Lincoln, but worse than that, it brought fearful retaliation upon the field of battle. The most terrible case of Confederate cruelty was the massacre at Fort Pillow when, when uh, Major Booth refused to surrender the fort. The Confederate General Forrest gave a signal and his troops made a fierce charge. In 10 minutes, they had swept in. Federal troops surrendered, but an indiscriminate, an indiscriminate massacre followed. The black troops were shot down in their tracks, pinioned to the ground with bayonets and sabers. Some were clubbed to death while dying of wounds. Others were made to get down upon their knees in which condition they were shot to death. Some were burned alive, having been fastened inside the buildings while still others were nailed against the houses, tortured, and then burned to a crisp. The dilemma of the South in the matter of Negro troops grew more perplexing. Negroes made good soldiers. That the Northern experiment had proven beyond peradventure. The prospect of freedom was leading an increasing stream of black troops into the Federal Army. This stream could be diverted into the Southern Army if the lure of freedom were offered by the Confederacy. But this would be an astonishing ending for a war in defense of slavery. In the first year, <clears throat> excuse me. In the first year of the war, large numbers of Negroes <clears throat> were in the service of the Confederates as laborers. In January at Mobile, numbers of Negroes from the plantations of Alabama were at work on the redoubts. These were very substantially made and strengthened by sandbags and sheet iron. Elsewhere in the South, Negroes were employed in uh, building fortifications as teamsters and helpers in army service. In 1862, the Florida legislature conferred authority upon the governor to impress slaves for military purposes, if so authorized by the Confederate government. The Confederate Congress provided by law in February 1864 for the impressment of 20,000 slaves for menial service in the Confederate army. 
President Davis was so satisfied with their labor that he suggested in his annual message, November 1864, that this number should be increased to 40,000 with a promise of emancipation at the end of their service. In Louisiana, the adjutant uh, general's office of the militia stated that, quote, the governor and the commander in chief relying implicitly upon the loyalty of the free colored population of the city and state for the protection of their homes, their property, and for Southern rights from the pollution of a ruthless invader and believing that the military organization which existed prior to February 15th, 1862 and elicited praise and respect for their patriotic motives which promoted it should exist <clears throat> for and during the war, calls upon them to maintain their organization and hold themselves prepared for such orders as may be transmitted to them, unquote. Hmm. I'm going to read that one more time. <clears throat> In Louisiana, the adjutant general's office of the militia stated that, quote, the governor and the commander-in-chief relying implicitly upon, upon the loyalty of the free colored population of the city and state for the protection of their homes, their property, and for Southern rights from the pollution of a ruthless invader and believing that the military organization which, which existed prior to February 15th, 1862 and elicited praise and respect for the patriotic motives which prompted it should exist for and during the war calls upon them to maintain their organization and hold themselves prepared for such orders as may be transmitted to them, unquote. Hmm. These native guards joined the Confederate forces, but they did not leave the city with these troops. When General Butler learned of this organization, he sent for several of the prominent colored men and asked why they had accepted service under the Confederate government. They replied that they dared not refuse <laughs> and hoped by serving the Confederates to advance nearer to equality with the whites. Side eye. These um, in Charleston on January 2nd, uh, 150 free colored men offered their services to hasten the work of throwing up readouts along the coast. At Nashville, Tennessee, April 1861, a company of free Negroes offered their services to the Confederates, and at Memphis, a recruiting office, uh, recruiting office was opened. The legislature of Tennessee authorized Governor Harris on June 28, 1861 to receive into military service all male persons of color between the ages of 15 and 50. A procession of several hundred colored men marched under the command of Confederate officers and carried shovels, axes, and blankets. The Observer adds, they were brimful of patriotism, shouting for Jeff Davis and singing more songs. A paper in Lynchburg, Virginia, commented on the enlistment of 70 free Negroes to fight for the defense of the state, concluded with three cheers for the patriotic Negroes of Lynchburg. After the firing on Fort Sumter, several companies of Negro volunteers passed through Augusta on their way to Virginia. They consisted of 16 companies of volunteers and one Negro company from Nashville. In November of the same year, 28,000 troops passed before Governor Moore, General Lowell, and General Ruggles at New Orleans. The line of march was over seven miles, and one regiment comprised 1,400 free colored men. The Baltimore Traveler commented on arming Negroes at Richmond, said, Contrabands who have recently come within the federal lines at Williamsport report that all the able-bodied men in the vicinity are being taken to Richmond, formed into regiments, and armed for the defense of that city. In February 1862, the Confederate legislature of Virginia cons considered a bill to enroll all free Negroes in the state for service with the Confederate forces. When the Negroes helped the Confederates as forced laborers, forced laborers, and in a few instances as soldiers, the Confederates feared to trust them far and hated the idea of depending for victory and defense on these very persons whose slavery they were fighting. Mm, for whose slavery they were fighting. But in the last day, yeah, I guess that is a little bit of a conundrum, huh? <laughs> that you wanted them to defend you, but you were also not fighting for their freedoms, so that you wanted to keep them in slavery. But in the last days of the struggle, no straw could be overlooked. In December 1863, Major General Patrick R. Cleburne, who commanded a, a division 
in Hardy's Corps, Hardy's Corps of the Confederate Army of, of the Tennessee sent in a paper in which the employment of the slaves as soldiers of the South was vigorously advocated. Claiborne urged that freedom within a reasonable time be granted to every slave remaining true to the Confederacy and was moved to the action by the valor of the 54th Massachusetts, saying, if they, the Negroes, can be made to face and fight bravely against their former masters, how much more probable is it that with the allurement of higher reward and led by these masters, they would submit to discipline and face dangers? President Davis was not convinced and endorsed Cleburne's plea with the statement, I deem it in inexpedient at this time to give publicity to this paper and requested it be suppressed. Hmm. In September 1864, Governor Allen of Louisiana wrote to J.A. Seton, Secretary of War in the Confederate government, the time has come to put into the army every able-bodied Negro as a soldier. The Negro knows he cannot escape conscription if he goes to the enemy. He must play an important part in the war. He caused the fight and he will have his portion of the burden to bear. I would free all able to bear arms and put them in the field at once. In that year, 1864, um, in that year, 1864, 100,000 poor whites deserted the Confederate armies. In November, 1864, Jefferson Davis, in his message to the Confederate Congress, recognized that slaves might be needed in the Confederate Army. He said, the subject is to be viewed by us, therefore, solely in the light of policy and our social economy. When so regarded, I must dissent from those who advise a general le uh, levy and arming of slaves for the duty of soldier, soldiers, until our white population shall prove insufficient for the armies we require and can afford to keep the field to employ as a soldier the Negro, who has merely been trained to labor and as a laborer under the white man accustomed from his youth to use to the use of firearms would scarcely be deemed wise or advantageous by any and this is the question before us but should the alternative ever be presented of subjugation or of the employment of the slave as a soldier there seems no reason to doubt which should be our decision hmm. in response to an inqui inquiry uh, from the confederate secretary of war as to arming slaves, Howell Cobb of Georgia opposed the measure to arm the Negroes. I'm just gonna put them out there without any kind of, okay. I think that the, the proposition to make soldiers of our slaves is the most pernicious idea that is, has been suggested since the war began. You cannot make soldiers of slaves or slaves of soldiers. Uh, the moment you resort to Negro soldiers, your white soldiers will be lost to you. And one secret of the favor with which the proposition is received in portions of the army is the hope that when Negroes go into the army, they, the whites, will be permitted to retire. It is simply a proposition to fight the balance of the war with Negro troops. You can't keep white and black troops together and you can't trust Negroes by themselves. Use all the Negroes you can get for a for all purposes for which you need them, but don't arm them. The day you make soldiers of them is the beginning of the end of the revolution, unquote. Oh, is this the one that the Cobb Center is, Howell Cobb, the Cobb Center is that who it's named after in Atlanta? J.P. Benjamin, Secretary of State, on the other hand, declared that the slaves would be made to fight against the South if Southerners failed to arm them for their own defense. He advocated emancipation for such black soldiers at a large meeting at Richmond. We have 680,000 blacks capable of bearing arms and, and who ought now to be in the field. Let us now say to every Negro who wishes to go into the ranks on condition of being free, go and fight. You are free. In a letter to President Davis, another correspondent added, I would not make a soldier of the Negro if, he could, if it could be helped, but we are reduced to this last resort. Sam Clayton of Georgia wrote, the recruits should come from our Negroes, nowhere else. We should away with pride of opinion, away with false pride and promptly take hold of all the means God has placed without, without our reach, without has placed without our reach to help us through this struggle, a war for the right of self-government. Some people say the Negroes will not fight. I say they will fight, 
They fought at Ocean Pond, Aloostee, Florida, Honey Hill, and other places. The enemies, the enemy fights us with Negroes and they will do very well to fight the Yankees. The enemy fights us with Negroes and they will do very well to fight the Yankees. In January 1865, General Lee sent his, celebrate, uh, his celebrated statement to Andrew Hunter. This is what General Lee said. We should not expect slaves to fight for prospective freedom when they can secure it at once by going to the enemy in whose service they will incur no great, greater risk than in ours. The reasons that induced me to recommend the employment of Negro troops at all render the effect of the measures I have suggested upon slaver, slavery immaterial. And in my opinion, the best means of securing the efficiency and fidelity of this auxiliary force would be to accompany the measure with a, a well-digested plan of gradual and general emancipation as that will be the result of the continuance of the war and will certainly occur if the enemy succeeds. It seems to me most advisable to do it at once and there, thereby obtain all the benefits that will accrue to our cause. Huh. This letter was discussed by the Confederates and, and February 8th, Senator Brown of Mississippi introduced into the Confederate Congress a resolution which would have freed 200,000 Negroes and enrolled them in the army. This was voted down. Jefferson Davis, in a letter to John Forsyth, February 1865, said that all arguments as to the positive adv advantage or disadvantage of employing them are besides the question, or beside the question, which is simply one of relative advantage between having their fighting element in our ranks or in those of the enemy. On February 11th, another bill to enroll 200,000 Negro soldiers was introduced, and for a while it looked as though it would pass. General Lee again wrote, declaring the measure not only expedient, but necessary, and that under proper circumstances, the Negroes will make efficient soldiers. What kind of circumstances are we talking about, General Lee? What, what, you want them to be your soldier, but you, okay. I want to know what those, what those stipulations were. I'm going to look that up. The Richmond Whig of uh, February 20th, 1865 declared that the proposition to put Negroes in the army has gained rapidly of late and promises in some form or other to be adopted. The enemy has taught us a lesson to which we ought not to shut our eyes. He has caused him to fight as well, if not better than have his white troops of the same length of service. Jefferson Davis discussed, discussed the matter with the governor of Virginia and said that he had been in conference with the Secretary of War and the adjutant general. He declared that the aid of recruiting officers for the purpose of enlisting Negroes would be freely accepted. March 17th, it was said, we shall have a Negro army. Letters are pouring into the departments from men of military skill and character asking authority to raise companies, battalions, and regiments of Negro troops. Thus, on recommendation from General Lee and Governor Smith of Virginia, and with the approval, approval of President Davis, an act was passed by the Confederate Congress, March 13, 1865, enrolling slaves in the Confederate Army. Oh! Each state was to furnish a quota of the total 300,000. The preamble of the act reads as follows. Can you imagine what that must have felt like? Fighting against your freedom. Yo. Okay, the preamble of the act reads as follows. An act to increase the military force of the Confederate States. The Congress of the Confederate States of America so enact that in order to provide additional forces to repel invasion, maintain the rightful possession of the Confederate States, secure their independence and preserve their institutions, the president be, and he is hereby authorized to ask for and accept from the owners of slaves the services of such number of able-bodied Negro men as he may deem expedient for and during the war to perform military service in whatever capacity he may direct. The language used implied that volunteering was to be rewarded by freedom. 
You know they didn't mean that. Implied that you would be free if you fought. They didn't mean that. Ugh. Generally cooperated with the War Department in hastening the recruit recruiting of Negro troops. Recruiting officers were uh, appointed in nearly all southern states. Lieutenant John L. Cowardin, adjutant 19th Battalion, Virginia Artil Artillery, was ordered April 1st, 1865 to recruit Negro troops according to the act. On March 30th, 1865, Captain Edward Bostick was ordered to raise four companies in South Carolina. Other officers were ordered to raise companies in Alabama, Florida, Virginia. It was the opinion, quote, it was the opinion of President Davis on learning of the passage of the act that not so much was accomplished as would have been if the act had been passed earlier so that during the winter the slaves could have been drilled and made ready for the made been, had been drilled and made ready for the spring campaign of 1865 unquote it was too late now and on april 9th 1865 lee surrendered negroes well within the confederate lines were not insensible of what was going on a colored newspaper said Secret associations were at once organized in Richmond, which rapidly spread throughout Virginia, where the venerable patriarchs of the uh, oppressed people prayerfully assembled together to deliberate on the proposition of taking up arms in defense of the South. There was but one opinion as to the re rebellion and its objection and, and its object, but the question which puzzled them most was how were they to act the part about to be assigned to them in this martial drama? After a cordial change of opinions, it was decided with great un unanimity, un unanimity, 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 <laughs> unanimity, <laughs> and finally ratified by all the auxiliary associations everywhere that black men should promptly respond to the call of the rebel chiefs whenever it should be made for them to take up arms. Quote, a question arose as to what position they would likely occupy an engagement, which occasioned no little solicitude, solicitude, from which all minds were relieved by agreeing that if they were placed in front, as soon as the battle began, the Negroes were, raised, were to raise a shout about Abraham Lincoln and the Union, and satisfied there would be plenty of supports from the federal force, they were to turn like uncaged tigers upon the rebel hordes. Should they be placed in the rear, it was also understood that as soon as firing began, they were to charge furiously upon the chivalry, um, which would place them between two fires, which would disastrously defeat the army of Lee, if not accomplish its entire annihilation, unquote. Of the effect of Negro soldiers in the Northern Army, there can be no doubt. John C. Underwood, resident of Virginia for 20 years, said before the Committee on Reconstruction... I had a conversation with one of the leading men in that city, and he said to me that the enlistment of Negro troops by the United States was a turning point of the rebellion, that it was the heaviest blow they ever received. He remarked that when the Negroes deserted their masters and showed a general disposition to do so and join the forces of the United States, intelligent men everywhere saw that the matter was ended. I have often heard a similar expression of opinion from others, and I am satisfied the, that the origin of this bitterness toward the Negro is this, dis, is this belief among the leading men that their weight thrown into the scale decided the contest against them. However the fact may be, I think that such is a pretty well-settled conclusion among leading rebels in Virginia." Unquote. A Union general said, the American Civil War of 1861 to 1865 marks an epoch not only in the history of the, of the United States, but in that of democracy and civilization. Its issue has vitally affected the course of human progress. To the student of history, it ranks along the conquests of Alexander, the incursions of the barbarians, the Crusades, the discovery of America, and the American Revolution. It settled the question of our national unity with all the consequences attached, attaching thereto. It exhibited in a very striking manner the power of a free people to preserve their, their form of government against its most dangerous foe, civil war. It not only enfranchised four millions of American slaves of African descent, but made slavery forever impossible in the great republic and gave a new impulse to the cause of human freedom, unquote. It was not the abolitionist alone who freed the slaves. 
the abolitionists never had a real majority of the people of the United States back of them. Had a real majority of the people of the United States back of them. Freedom for the slave was the logical result of a crazy attempt to wage war in the midst of four million back, in the midst of four million black slaves, and trying the while sublime, uh, and trying the while sublimely to ignore interests of those slaves in the outcome of the fighting. Yet these slaves had enormous power in their hands. Simply by stopping work, they could threaten the Confederacy with starvation. By walking into the federal camps, they showed to doubting Northerners the easy possibility of using them as workers and as servants, as farmers and as spies, and finally as fighting soldiers. And not only using them thus, but by the same gesture, depriving their enemies of their use in just these fields. It was a fugitive slave who made the slaveholders face the alternative of surrendering to the North or to the Negroes. It was the fugitive slave who made the slaveholders face the alternative of surrendering to the North or to the Negroes. It was this plain alternative that brought Lee's sudden surrender. Either the South must make terms with its slaves, free, free them, use them to fight the North, and thereafter no longer treat them as bondsmen, or they could surrender to the North with the assumption that the North after the war must help them to defend slavery as it, had, as it had before. It was then that the abolition came in as a determining factor and itself was transformed to a new democratic movement. So in blood and servile war, freedom came to America. What did it mean to men? The paradox of democracy founded on slavery had at last been done away with, but it became more and more customary as time went on to linger on and emphasize the freedom which emancipation brought to the masters and later to the poor whites. On the other hand, strangely enough, not as much has been said of what freedom meant to the freed. Of the sudden wave of glory that rose and burst above four million people and of the echoing shout that brought joy to 400,000 fellows of African blood in the North, can we imagine the spectacular revolution? Not, of course, unless we think of these people as human beings like ourselves. Not unless, assuming this common humanity, we conceive ourselves in a position where we are chattels and real estate, and then suddenly in a night become thenceforward and forever free. Unless we can do this, there is, of course, no point in thinking of this central figure in emancipation. By assuming the common humanity of these people conceived of what happened, before the war, the slave was curiously isolated. This was the policy and the effective policy of the slave system, which made the plantation the center of a black group with a network of white folk around and about who kept the slaves from contact with each other. Of course, clandestine contact there always was. The passing of Negroes to and fro on errands, particularly the semi-freedom and mingling in cities, and, and yet the mass of slaves were curiously provincial and, and kept out of the currents of information. There came the slow looming of emancipation. Crowds and armies of the unknown, inscrutable and unfathomable Yankee. Cruelty behind and before, rumors of a new slave trade, but slowly, continuously, the wild truth, the bitter truth, the magic truth came surging through. There was to be a new freedom and a black nation went tramping after the armies no matter what it suffered, no matter how it was treated, no matter how it died. First, without masters, without food, without shelter. Then, with new masters, food that was free and improvised shelters, cabins, and homes. And at last, land. They prayed. They worked. They danced and sang. They studied to learn. They wanted to wander. Some, for the first time in their lives, saw town. Some left the plantation and walked out into the world. Some handled actual money, and some with arms in their hands actually fought for freedom. An unlettered leader of fugitive slaves pictured it. Quote, and then we saw the lightning, 
That was the guns. And then we heard the thunder. That was the big guns. And then we heard the rain falling. And that was the drops of blood falling. And when we came to get in the craps, it was dead men that we reaped. The mass of slaves, even the more intelligent ones, and certainly the great group of field hands were in religious and hysterical fervor. This was the coming of the Lord. This was the fulfillment of prophecy and legend. Um, it was the golden dawn after chains of a thousand years. It was everything miraculous and perfect and promising. For the first time in their life, they could travel, they could see, they could change the dead level of their labor. They could talk to friends and sit at sundown and in moonlight, listening and imparting wonder tales. They could hunt in the swamps and fish in the rivers. And above all, they could stand up and assert themselves. They need not fear the patrol. They need not even cringe before a white face and touch their hats. To the small group of literate and intelligent black folk, North and South, this was a sudden beginning of an entirely new era. They were at last to be recognized as men. And if they were given the proper social and political power, their future as American citizens uh, was assured. Their future as American citizens was assured. They had therefore to talk and agitate for their civil and political rights. With these in thought and objects stood some of the intelligent slaves of the South. On the other hand, the house servants and mechanics among the freed slaves faced difficulties. The bonds which held them to their former masters were not merely sentimental. The masters had stood between them and the world in which they had no legal protection except the master. The masters were their source of information. The question then was how far they could forsake the power of the masters even when it was partially overthrown. For whom would the slave mechanic work and how could he collect his wages? What would be his status in court? What protection would he have against the compete, competing me mechanic? Back of this, through it all, combining their own intuitive sense with what friends and leaders taught them, these black folk wanted two things. First, land, which they could own and work for their own crops. This was the natural outcome of slavery. Some of them had been given by their masters little plots to work on and raise their own food. Sometimes they raised hogs and chickens in addition. This faint beginning of industrial freedom now pictured to them economic freedom. They wanted little farms which would make them independent. Then, in addition to that, they wanted to know they wanted they wanted they wanted to know. They wanted to be able to interpret the uh, Kabbalistic letters and figures which were the key to more. Hmm. They were consumed with the curiosity at the meaning of the world. First and foremost, just what was this that had recently happened about them? This upturning of the universe and revolution, the whole social fabric. Huh. And what was its relation to their own dimly remembered past of the West Indies and Africa, Virginia and, and Kentucky? They were consumed with desire for schools, the uprising of the black man, the pouring of himself into organized efforts for education in those years between 1861 and 1871 was one of the marvelous occurrences in the modern world, almost without parallel, parallel in the history of civilization. The movement that was started was irresistible. It planted the free common school in a part of the nation and a part of the whole where it had never been known and never been recognized before. Free then with a desire for land and a frenzy for schools and the Negro lurched into the new day. Suppose on some gray day as you plod down Wall Street, you should see God sitting on the treasury steps in his glory with the thunders curved about him. Hmm? Suppose on Michigan Avenue between the lakes and the hills of stone in the, in the midst of hastening automobiles, and jostling crowds, suddenly you see living and walking towards you the Christ with sorrow and sunshine in his face. Foolish talk all of this, you say, of course, and that is because no American now believes in, the, in his religion. Its facts are mere symbolism, its revelation vague, vague generalities. 
It's ethics, a matter of carefully balanced gain. And to most of the four million black folk emancipated by civil war, God was real. They knew him. They had met him personally in many a wild orgy of religious frenzy or in the black stillness of the night. His plan for them was clear. They were to suffer and be degraded and then afterwards by divine edict raised to manhood and power. And so on January 1st, 1863, he made them free. It was all foolish, bizarre, and tawdry. Gangs of dirt Negroes howling and dancing, poverty-stricken ignorant laborers mistaking war, destruction, and revolution for the mystery of the free human soul. And yet to these black folk, it was the apocalypse. The magnificent, magnificent trumpet tones of Hebrew scripture transmuted and oddly changed became a strange new gospel. Uh, all that was beauty, all that was love, all that was truth, stood on the top of these mad mornings and sang with the stars. A great human sob shrieked in the wind and tossed its tears upon the sea. Free, free, free. There was a joy in the South. It rose like perfume, like prayer. Men stood quivering, slim, dark girls, wild and beautiful with wrinkled hair swept, wept silently. Young women, black, tawny, white and golden, lifted shivering hands and old and broken mothers, black and gray, raised their great voices and shouted to God across the fields and up to the rocks and the mountains. A great song arose, the loveliest thing born this side the seas. It was a new song. It did not come from Africa, though the dark throb and beat of that ancient of days was in it and through it. It did not come from white America, never from so pale and hard and thin a thing, however deep these vulgar and surrounding tones had driven. Not the Indies, nor the hot South, the cold East or heavy West made that music. It was a new song and its deep and plaintive beauty, its great cadences and wild appeal wailed, throbbed and thundered on the world's ears with a message sel seldom voiced by man. It swelled and blossomed like incense, improvised and born anew out of the age long past and weaving into its texture the old and new melodies in word and thought. They sneered at it, those white Southerners who heard it and never understood. They raped and defiled it, those white Northerners who listened without ears. Yet it lived and grew. Always it grew and swelled and lived and it sits today at the right hand of God as America's one real gift to beauty, as slavery's one redemption distilled from the dross of its dung. The world at first neither saw nor understood of all that most Americans wanted, this freeing of slaves was the last. Everything black was hideous. Everything Negro did, Negroes did was wrong. If they fought for freedom, they were beasts. If they did not fight, they were born slaves. If they cowered on the plantations, they loved slavery. If they ran away, they were lazy loafers. If they sang, they were silly. If they scowled, they were impudent. The bites and blows of a nation fell on them. All a hatred that the whites after the Civil War had for each other gradually concentrated itself on them. They caused the war, they its victims. They were guilty of all the thefts of those who stole. They were the cause of wasted property and small crops. They had impoverished the South and plunged the North into endless debt. And they were funny, funny, ridiculous baboons aping man. Southerners who had suckled food from black breasts vied with each other in fornication with black women and even in beastly incest. They took the name of their fathers in vain to seduce their own sisters. Nothing, nothing that black folk did or said or thought or sang was sacred. For 70 years, few Americans did dare to say a fair word about a Negro. There was no one kind of Negro who was freed from slavery. The freedmen were not an undifferentiated group. There were those among them who were cowed and altogether bitter. 
There were the cowed who were humble. There were those openly bitter and defiant, but whipped into submission or ready to run away. Uh, there were the debauched and the furtive, petty thieves and licentious scoundrels. There were the few who could read and write, and some even educated beyond that. There were the children and the grandchildren of white masters. There were the house servants trained in manners and in servile respect for the upper class. There were the ambitious who sought by means of slavery to gain favor or even freedom. There were the artisans who had, certain, uh, had a certain modicum of freedom in their work were often hired out and worked practically as free laborers. The impact of legal freedom upon these various classes differed in all sorts of ways. And yet emancipation came not simply to black folks in 1863. To white Americans came slowly a new vision and a new uplift, a sudden freeing of hateful mental shadows. At last democracy was to be justified of its own children. The nation was to be purged of continual sin. Not indeed all of its own doing, due partly to its inheritance, and yet a sin. A negation that gave the world the right to sneer at the pretensions of this republic. At last, there could really be a free commonwealth of free men. Thus, amid enthusiasm and philanthropy and religious fervor that surged over the whole country, the black man became, in word, henceforth and forever free. Fondly do we hope and fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills, that it continue until all the wealth piled up by the bondsmen's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn by the lash shall be paid and another drawn with the sword, as it was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Thus spake Father Abraham, the imperial gorilla of Washington. Lord of armies, vaster than any, any of the Caesars ever saw, over a barnyard reeking with offal and a land dripping with tears and blood. And suddenly, there was a reason in all this mad orgy. Suddenly, the world knew why this blundering horror of civil war had to be. God had come to America and the land, fire drunk, howled the hymn of joy. The hymn of joy written by Schiller is translated, I wrote a translation. Joy, beautiful spark of divinity, daughter of Elysium, we enter drunk with fire. Heavenly one, thy sanctuary, thy magic binds again what custom strictly divided. All people become brothers where they gently, where thy gentle wing abides. Be embraced with millions, all people, all people. And that is a German, he writes the German here and I'm going to give you my terrible, my terrible German um, gleaned from a few arias that I, <laughs> learned in in college but here you go this is how it is written in the text um, an excerpt from Ode to Joy by Schiller Freude schöne Gottfunken Tochter aus Illusium wir betreten wo ihr trunken im Lischen dein Heiligtum deine Zauber binden wieder was die Mode schreit Geteilt, alle Menschen werden Brüder. Wo dein safter Flüge fällt, Said umschlingen Millionen. Alle Menschen, alle Menschen. All people, all people.